and um, and that shit did happen. So that's not what I want to happen. What I would rather see happen is for vigilante justice to be done to that mob who had killed that black man. There's a murder that happened. The mob had watched it. They're all fucking guilty. So they all should be fucking hung up in a tree, right? They should. It's eye for an eye. You murdered somebody. You was an accomplice to that murder. Murder should happen to you. So vigilante, also um, the stand your ground law the, for vigilanteism, they get in it all, all backwards with the Trayvon Martin case. That was another issue or case that came up. Um, I think the, the guy, other, the other guy that was quoting had talked about the case. Um, but the stand your ground law, it's, it's fucked up that it's being used to defend Zimmerman because seriously the stand your ground law would have defended Trayvon. And Trayvon had an imminent threat. There was a person that was stalking him, following him, looking like he was going to do something and eventually kills him so you know he had a gun on him he has a if you feel like there's going to be death or imminent danger that's going to happen to you you're allowed to stand your ground you don't have to fucking flee and run away you can say nah this is some bullshit this is where the fuck the buck stops here so Trayvon Martin when he saw that he was being pursued could have said stop I'm going to get down on your knees I'm going to arrest you um, and if they, you know, uh, resisted his citizen's arrest, then he could fucking use whatever force was necessary. And especially if he saw a gun come up, then he could, you know, defend himself in terms of defending his life. So, uh, if the stand your ground law was used effectively because vigilanteism, now you don't want just everybody doing whatever, but you also don't want people to be powerless. I mean, I, I got robbed two times in Louisville and the police took a report and walked off and I was kind of like, well, what if they come back? Motherfuckers just driving by fucking taunting me and shit, right? And uh, I was like, what if they come back? And he's like, oh, just give us a call. He's like, well, I mean, you didn't even go, like, interview them today. You didn't even go ask them anything today. So if you won't do shit when they actually break, uh, you know, into my house, that you're going to say something. If they come to my house, by the time you get here, they're gone. Uh, seriously, people, you cannot leave people so defenseless. And so when the police, you know, the LMPD fucking sucks as they do, then you have to be a man. you got to defend your own territory, your own turf. Right, so the uh, Trayvon Martin, he sh should have been allowed to, in that incident, to allow to shoot Zimmerman. It had uh, Stanger Grant actually been employed because there was clearly a pursuer and clearly the aggressor was the one who was pursuing. And so stand your ground would be against the aggressor. It would be against the stalker and the person who initiated the confrontation. And so therefore stand your ground would say that... Um, uh, uh, George Zimmerman should have been shot by Trayvon Martin as soon as Zimmerman realized he was a threat to his life. So, um, I don't know anything about the story of Margaret Garner, says Mr. Boodig, uh, that's who owns the fucking farm now. I'm very interested. We'll be quietly taking some steps to get action on this, said Ann Butler, professor. So they're going to check this, uh, this, this building to see if it's actually... Um, a historical building like they had thought. So I'm just going to keep on uh, talking about Margaret Gardner, okay? So in 1856, January 26, 1856, Margaret Gardner kills her three-year-old baby girl, Mary, um, a slave because she didn't want to go back into slavery. So they run to Cincinnati. It was from a Boone County plantation, Boone County plantation called Maplewood, and Archibald Gaines is the fucking slave owner, rapist, fucking oppressor, molester, fucking sick psycho piece of shit that it put all the oppression on Margaret Gardner where she thought that murdering her own child was actually within the um, you know reign of of okay behavior you're gonna oh fine you're gonna put us back into fucking slavery so we can get raped over and over again fuck you fuck you and and fuck my daughter's life um but the moral, uh, moral conundrum does show you know, the horrors of slavery. She would rather her child die than to have to fucking live um, without freedom. So, um, uh, described as an unnamed mulatto on the 1850 slave census, so she's her, they're saying she's a, a mulatto. Margaret was an enslaved domestic on the Archibald K. Gaines farm in Richwood. In Boone County. So it's in Richwood. Archibald K. Gaines is in Richwood. Pregnant, 22-year-olds at the time of her escape, Margaret was accompanied by her husband, Robert Garner, 21, his parents, and her four children, ages 9 months to 6 years. So there's like six or seven of them. The family fled from Kentucky in record cold temperatures, about 10 degrees, crossing the frozen Ohio River into Cincinnati, Ohio. 
So the fucking river's frozen, and that, you know, they went over the frozen river. I don't know if they had, like, well, I couldn't imagine how cold it was. Underlying the escape plan was Robert's familiar, familiarity with Cincinnati, less than 20 miles away. Robert was enslaved on the farm of James Marshall near the Gaines Estate, but was often hired out as a laborer and also marketed hogs in Cincinnati. Upon arriving in the city, the gardeners took refuge with Margaret's cousin, Elijah Kite, who was a free black man, to, and he was waiting for instructions from Quaker abolitionist Levi Coffin, who's known as like the fucking godfather father of the Underground Railroad. But instead of Levi Coffin coming to the rescue, the runaways were surrounded by a U.S. Marshal's party, which included Gaines and Marshall's son in jail. So this is a time um, justified, right? You had Raylan Givens, um, who's uh, uh, going around as a U.S. Marshal Institute in justice. But here's a U.S. Marshal Service that's being used against horrible shit. So U.S. Marshals was to chase, you know, fugitive slaves. If you were a slave and you ran away, they say you stole property, and the property was you, your own life. So, um, after the murder happened, it actually it turns into like a big call celebre. The the um, the abolitionists are because there's a moral conundrum. She she's a she, they're from Kentucky, but they went to Ohio. So she had stole the slave property herself, right in Kentucky, and killed the kid. So you know took property away from him. They wanted to try her for theft in Kentucky, but in uh, and for uh, breaking the Fugitive Slave Act, um, and you know breaking out the institution of slavery by running away and all. Also, Ohio wanted to try her for murder. They went, you killed a person, so we're going to try you for murder. So that's why the Kentucky wanted jurisdiction, Ohio wanted jurisdiction. Then you had the anti- or the abolitionists who they, you know, got excited about the case and wanted to, um, you know, look how horrible it is. Why else would she do this if it wasn't like a really horrible institution? Um you know, as as it as it was, it's pretty shitty. So, the Franklin Pierce was the president, and then Salmon Salmon P. Chase was the governor. So, Salmon P. Chase is the governor of Ohio. Northern Kentucky University, the, the law school is called the Salmon P. Chase Law School, and President Franklin Pierce, which I know nothing about him, but it's 1856. Five years later, we're going to have a big ass civil war. So, Franklin Pierce wasn't able to stop that from happening. Margaret Garner, who uh, was a slave to Archibald Gaines, that sliced a three-year-old's throat. She killed her own daughter's throat instead of seeing her go back into slavery. And um, Salmon P. Chase is the governor of Ohio. He's anti-slavery, but in Kentucky, you know, is very much fucking loves slavery and shit. And so they fight to get Margaret Gardner to be tried in Kentucky for um, um, uh, theft. Um, and then Ohio was trying to try her for murder. And this all has to do with vigilante justice, right? Um, Archibald Gaines is the one that leads his posse to go get this shit. So this is sort of fucked up. This is fucked up, you know. Fu if, if Margaret Garner was a criminal, then everything, you know, all the things that had led up to uh, uh, the chase and shit and the, getting the warrant would be warranted. But if it's, if they're not... If you're defending a fucking bad institution, this is how shit goes down when you got the power of the state. Um, so, okay, the Gardner arrest was almost the last, the last of the great fugitive cases in the 1850s that seemed to overshadow all which had gone before, even the case of Sherman Booth of Wisconsin, which was then making its way to the Supreme Court for decision, did not create such a feeling. The nation was much aroused as it had been over the return of Anthony Burns to slavery in 1854 when it required the assistance of a battalion of troops to take him out of Boston. So Anthony Burns, in two years beforehand, was in, you know, Boston, and it took a fucking battalion of troops just to fucking apprehend him. Resentment in Ohio was the deeper for the attempt less than a year before the Gardner case to get a United States commissioner to send a Negro named Rosetta Armstead back to the South. Her master took her to Cincinnati, and she refused to return to slavery. When the U.S. Marshal arrested her under the commissioner's warrant, even though a state court had declared her free, the state sought to punish the Marshal for contempt. A writ of habeas corpus issued by Justice John McLean saved him from imprisonment. The Gardner case appeared to have been an even clearer attempt to disregard Ohio law. It was not that Cincinnati itself was friendly to fugitive slaves. The Southern Ohio, there was a marked antipathy towards abolition. 
So there was a anti-sentiment triumph at the polls in the 1855 elections, but it didn't, you know, the, the fucking racists were all fucking pissed. 1855 changed things. It was mad about it. A typical dispatch relating the first events of the story was telegraphed to the New York Daily Times by its Cincinnati correspondent on January 28, 1856. The message advised briefly, a stampede of slaves from the border counties of Kentucky took place last night. One slave woman, finding escape impossible, cut the throats of her children, killing one instantly and severely wounding two others. Six of the fugitives were apprehended, but eight are said to have escaped. Old Simon Garner, his wife Mary, and Simon Jr. were the slaves of James Marshall of Richwood Station, Boone County, Kentucky. Margaret Garner, the wife of Simon Jr., and their four children belonged to Archibald K. Gaines, owner of a nearby plantation. Late in the night, Sunday, January 27, 1856, the Gardners fled, taking with them nine slave friends from other plantations, all crowded into a large horse-drawn sleigh and sped over ice-covered roads to the Ohio River about 16 miles away. The road was well known to the slaves. The Gardners had been to Cincinnati before. The winter of 1855-1856 was particularly cold and the river, which usually constituted a barrier to runaways, was now frozen into a convenient footbridge from slavery to freedom. They abandoned their carriage and as fast as Margaret Gardner's pregnant condition would allow hurried across. So she's fucking pregnant too. Right, she's fucking pregnant also. So by the time it was daylight, realizing that 17 Negroes walking together through the streets of Cincinnati would be conspicuous, they separated into two groups. One little band of nine friends uh, went to the Underground Railroad, and the North Star led them to Canada. The other eight persons were the Gardner family. And after making several inquiries, the Gardners found the home of their kinsman, Elijah Kite. He spent but a moment of precious time in greeting, then hastened to the shop at 6 and Elm Streets belonging to Levi Coffin, president of the Underground Railroad. Kite reported the new arrivals and received instructions on forwarding them to the next station of the Underground. He hurried home to comply with orders, but barely had he returned when an arresting party surrounded his house and demanded the peaceable surrender of the fugitives. Someone of whom the gardeners asked directions had betrayed them. So they had asked directions from somebody on the street, and then they fucking betrayed him. The slave owners had lost no time in taking up the pursuit. Archibald K. fucking Gaines. Archibald, fuck, fuck you, Gaines. Archibald fucking Gaines. He had accompanied by the son of James Marshall, the other slaveholder. Fuck James Marshall. Fucking slaveholders. Arrived in Cincinnati at 7 in the morning after the escape. They quickly obtained a warrant for the rest. Other slaves pursuant to the fugitive slave law with some friends and a force of deputy United States Marshals. They sought the Gardner family and found them at the home of Elijah Kite. Inside the cabin, the frightened, the frightened slaves hastily barred the doors and the windows, but they realized that they were lost. Simon Gardner Jr. fired two rounds from a revolver, and this kept the arresting party off for a while, but it was hopelessly clear that nothing could save the Gardners from capture. Suddenly, Margaret Gardner seized a butcher knife and turned it upon her three-year-old daughter with swift and terrible force she hacked at the child's throat again and again she struck until the little girl was almost decapitated the two Gardner men began to scream, unable to bear the horror. They ran wildly about in the cabin. Now Margaret Gardner turned toward one of her little boys who pleaded piteously with his mother not to kill him. She called to old Mary Gardner, Mother, help me to kill the children. The old woman began to wail and wring her ha hands. Her eyes could not endure the murder of her grandchildren. She ran for refuge under a bed. Finally, Elijah Kite's wife managed to disarm Margaret Gardner, who all the while sobbed while she would rather kill every one of her children than have them taken back across the river. The arresting party cautiously approached the house. One deputy marshal forced a window and jumped into the cabin, but Simon Jr. leveled a pistol at him. The marshal attempted to arrest the weapon from the fugitive, and in the struggle, the pistol was discharged. Two fingers were shot out from the marshal's hand, and the ball ricocheted, struck him in the lip, and dislocated several of the marshal's teeth who was enforcing a fucking, you know, unjust law. He withdrew from the cabin. The arresting party next brought up a heavy timber, battered down the front door, and the literal house was carried 
in the little house was carried. Margaret Gardner fought wildly, but at last overpowered when Gaines and the marshals were able to look about the cabin. Their eyes met the almost lifeless body of the little girl. Two other children were bleeding profusely, and a fourth, an infant of less than a year, was badly bruised. One of Gaines's party took the dying girl into his arms, but the crowd, which had gathered, would not let her be taken along with the other slaves. A moment later, the child was dead. As quickly as horse-drawn omnibuses could carry them, the Gardners were brought to the federal courthouse in Cincinnati. Here, Gaines Gaines made application to John L. Pendary, a United States Commissioner for the Southern District of Ohio, for a certificate to transport his slaves back to Kentucky. James Marshall's son had neglected to bring a power of attorney, so he could not act to reclaim the slaves. Hearings were therefore postponed. It was impossible.